Hi everyone, welcome back to Art of the Part. In these next few videos, we're gonna explore Mastercam with the Yule Pop Topper case study, and we're gonna do multi-op programming within the same MCAM file. So in the last few videos, we discussed setting up our work holding as well as our soft jaws, and then actually drawing the Yule Pop Topper and doing some FEA testing. So this assembly should look pretty familiar to you. We have our five axis bison riser, uh, we were used to seeing the hard jaws here, but we actually replaced those and swapped them out for some soft jaws. And then we centered our yield pop topper here in the middle of these two. And then uh, I just made a configuration uh, for the machine pro or the machine uh, version of the yield pop topper. Um, all that is is I, I suppressed or removed the edge brakes or the chamfers that are going around the part here. And I think it's just a little bit easier to program two sharp edges whenever we're doing chamfers or uh, deburring inside Mastercam rather than putting that uh, detail inside of SolidWorks and then pulling it in that way. So that said, uh, I want you to actually uh, go to the Google Drive or maybe you've already done this, but there's a handful of files that I want you to download. Uh, so we have our soft jaw A-1, which is the assembly that you see here in the background. Um, so if you want to, you could save this out and then pull this directly in the master cam. The only thing is you'd actually have to set up all of your different planes and your levels. Um, but I actually made that and did that all for you in this MCAM file here, which is just the yield pop topper. Another thing that I want you to find or download is the tool library. So these are going to be two files here. Uh, there's going to be an Excel file, which is just all the information that is linked to our tool library inside the machine. You can see the name of the tool, whatever the tool is that we're purchasing, as well as the holder, and then different kinds of speeds and feeds, as well as like the exposed length of tool and plus holder length, and then actually recommended depths of pass. And we'll talk about that a little bit later here in the video as well. And then the uh, Mastercam library, which is all that information compressed down into a file here, is this DMU50, which is our tool library for the machine. So just make sure that you have those two files uh, accessible um, before you go ahead and get started. So I'm going to open up a blank session of Mastercam here and make sure that my session is set to inches. So if you're here inside of Mastercam, uh, we're just going to go to File and then go to Configuration. And then inside configuration, uh, make sure that your units for analyzed measurements is set to inches. And most importantly, make sure that the current profile is set to inches as well. So two places that you have to make sure that it's set to inches before you go ahead and start opening up your files because it might screw up something down the line when you have to convert it uh, with the units of measurement. So make sure that those are both set to inches and then hit the green check mark. Okay, so now we can go ahead and open up that Mastercam file that I set up for you. So if you go to File, open, uh, just locate that folder wherever you downloaded it to, and then find that yield pop topper MCAM file. So we'll click on that and select open. And once that is opened, uh, you'll notice that it is very similar to the assembly that we created inside SOLIDWORKS because it's the exact same thing that it imported. So we have the five axis vice and riser, we have our soft jaws, and then the yield pop topper here. So before we go ahead and get started, I do want to talk about a couple things in the background here. So if we are on the left hand side, uh, I want you to go over to the bottom tabs here and one is called planes. So we'll click on planes and you'll notice that I already set up your top planes for your op one, op two and op uh, for the uh, soft draw top. So whatever op that you're working on, and I'm gonna separate this into three different videos for op one, op two, and then the soft draw. I'll make sure to call that out at the beginning of the video too. But in this instance, we'll be working on uh, op one top. Uh, don't change that quite yet. I do wanna explain uh, our levels here, but we will uh, continue on by changing that op one top in here in a second. So uh, we're actually gonna select on levels uh, which is the next tab over from planes. So it's on the bottom left here, click on levels. And then you'll notice that all the different components uh, or parts that we pulled into the SOLIDWORKS assembly are represented here on uh, the levels tab. So I can actually toggle and turn on or off uh, the different parts uh, as I see fit. So for example, if I go over here to the planes and I set myself up for op one because right now this is op two. If I go over here to planes and I select op one and I change my G as well as my WCS, C and T, you'll notice that all of those different components are in the way and I actually can't see the part that I'm working on. So I will actually turn those off before I get started uh, 
programming because I don't want them to be included with any of the stock geometry or become interferences uh, when I'm using like dynamic milling. So let's go over here to levels again and we're actually going to turn off a handful of these different levels. And we only want to see the yield pop topper. And while we're here inside the levels tab, I do want you to create an additional level for me. Uh, so we're going to hit the plus button and we're going to make a level for wireframe geometry. So we'll just title this level wireframe. Again, all you have to do is hit the plus, it'll create a new level, and then you can type in wireframe. You'll notice that it's a little bit different than the other levels that we uh, have active inside of this assembly in the sense that there's an entity linked to uh, each one of these levels, whereas wireframe doesn't actually have any geometry quite yet. Uh, that will change. Uh, just make sure that this is uh, this has a green check mark next to wireframe because when I do create the wireframe geometry, I want it to default to that level. Okay. So we're gonna jump over here to toolpaths so we can see our machine ops and everything. And we'll go ahead and get started here with uh, first operation. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and set up a new machine for uh, the first operation. And one thing to consider is that when you're jumping from you know op one to op two to op three, Mastercam doesn't really know that you're either staying within a new, uh, the same machine or if you're going to a new machine. So you're gonna have to set up a, a machine profile uh, for every different operation that you're working in. So go ahead and select on mill and then we'll choose the default. So this would be op one. If you wanted to, you could type uh, title this uh, machine group uh, if it makes it any easier. Uh, just double click on it, you know, op one. And that just makes it easier for me when I'm jumping between my different operations and I know where I am inside of my tree here. So uh, we're gonna set up um, a couple different things before we actually do start programming. Uh, typically we've gone into uh, properties and we were able to select, you know, you know what's our program number, uh, stock setup, so, so on and so forth. If I clicked on one of these in 2022, it would have opened up a, a window with three different tabs. Uh, this is a little bit different here in 2023. Um, I'm just going to click on stock setup and we're just going to set up our stock here really quick. So the page is going to be a little bit different, um, but it's uh, very similar in the sense that uh, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to select on add from bounding box, which was the option we were using beforehand. Uh, we just have an icon for it now. So click on add from bounding box when you're in the stock setup page. And then um, you won't be able to select the part directly. You do want to be able to, or you want to make sure that you're selecting the little mouse button here, which allows you to select. And then uh, we'll click on the part itself, and then we'll click on end selection. So make sure that the part is highlighted in yellow, and then you can go ahead and hit end selection. And then uh, before you start putting in geometry, or, or sorry, dimensions for your geometry, make sure that you are setting your origin to the center of the part. So we're creating a stock bonding box at the center of the part. The dimensions here are going to be 2.75 for the width and X, and then Y and Z are going to be 1 and 1. And you should see something that looks like that. And we'll go ahead and hit the green check mark. And we should see a uh, transparent red box that's surrounding our part for our, our stock material. And that looks good, and we're going to hit the OK button. Now, another change that happened in 2023 is that we don't by default see the red dotted line that we're normally used to seeing. So the way that we're going to be able to turn that on and off is by going up here in stock uh, while you're in toolpaths and then toggling it either with the stock display or turning it off. So you just got to click that button or click it off. And then now, uh, just like what we set up other parts before in the past, is we have to set up uh, wireframe geometry to match the stock. So we can't actually pull or click on the uh, wire, or sorry, the stock uh, profile. So we'll have to actually create a hard geometry for it. So make sure that again you are here in the levels and you are defaulting to wireframe. And then we're going to uh, click on the wireframe uh, tab and then select bounding box. And just like what we did before in the previous step with setting up our stock material, we're gonna to have to set up another bounding box, but this is just going to be hard geometry versus mesh geometry. So we're gonna click on the uh, little mouse here, click on the part so that it turns yellow, uh, select end selection. Uh, make sure and double check that this is reading from the center of the part origin. Uh, I've noticed that maybe sometimes it might default on one of these other corners here. Uh, if it does, go ahead and uh, close out of this app, uh, this specific uh, step, and then restart it by uh, selecting a bounding box, selecting the part, and then uh, clicking on that center piece there. 
Okay, and then 2.75, oops, 2.75 for X, one for Y, and then one for Z. And then we'll click on the green check mark. So now I have uh, like the mesh geometry for the stock whenever I go into verify. And then I have the hard geometry that I can use for tool pathing and programming, which is the wireframe. So if you jump over here to the levels, you'll notice that I actually have now 12 entities that were uh, placed on that uh, wireframe uh, level, which is good because it's just uh, uh, one entity for each one of these lines of the bounding box here. Okay, so now I've set up my stock, I've set up my wireframe. Uh, let's go ahead and start moving into uh, programming toolpath. But I'm actually going to stop you there. Before we do that, I do want to make sure that we set up a proper tool library. So previously in other videos, we've just used default tool libraries and we've searched through an entire repository of like 500 different tools. In this instance, we are actually going to pull the tool library that we're using inside of the machine directly. Uh, so I created a like a carbon copy of it and I made sure all the measurements were matched and everything like that. And uh, we want to be able to see that when we uh, set up our verify and our simulations and everything. Likewise, when we post out our programs, we want to make sure that the tools match and that we're using the correct tooling. So, just like how I was talking about before, uh, Mastercam doesn't know that you're going from you know machine to machine machine, or if you're staying within the same machine, going from operation to operation. So every time that you go and create a new machine group or a new op, uh, you want to make sure that you set up your tool library for that specific machine or for that specific operation. So you'll be able to find that inside the tool paths. And then there is a little icon for tool manager. It's just a little collet with a tool sticking out. And when you click on that, you should see this little tool manager window. Now, here's where we're going to jump back and forth a handful of times. Uh, I asked you earlier uh, in the video to download a couple files. Uh, so we should have a file folder with the Excel file. And like I said, these are all the names of the tools, speeds and feeds, and then you know the recommended depths and passes. But we also have this DMU50-IIT, uh, and this is going to be a Mastercam tool library template. So what we'll do is we'll right click on this, and then we'll choose to copy it. So we're just going to copy this uh, tool library to our clipboard, and we're going to now paste it into um, our uh, tool manager or tool library here in the background. So as long as I have that uh, copied to my mouse, I can minimize that window. And previously, uh, in other videos, especially when we're just doing default, we were able to choose between a handful of different uh, tool libraries, and we could choose whatever uh, call it, uh, size that we had. So we have like an HSK 63 inch. So when we clicked on that and we loaded that tool library, there was like 500 different tools that we could choose from. However, we're actually going to now add our own tool library template to this tool library repository. And we'll just right click as long as we you know, copied that uh, li tool library from the, the previous window. Uh, we're gonna right click somewhere over here in the white space and we're gonna choose to uh, select paste. So that's actually going to, I have this tool library already in here but it'll probably default to you and then I'm gonna replace this destination for me. And it'll actually uh, locate and copy and paste a uh, tool library template with that name inside of um, this manager here. So we're going to click on open on that DMU50. And you'll notice that instead of having to choose through like 500 different tools, I now can select through the 18 or the 20 that uh, tools that are currently active inside of my machine. So this right here, this is your tool library, uh, the window on the bottom, and then the window on the top is actually your machine. So you want to be able to copy your tool library into the machine. And this is helpful because I could set up a tool library like with, you know, 50 different tools, but my uh, magazine can only hold 36. So what I'm going to do is choose and pick and choose the different tools that I want to include. Uh, in this instance, we're not running with too many. Um, so I can actually import all 18 tools to be used on this specific operation. So what we'll do is you're just going to create a bonding box by clicking and holding and dragging and selecting all the different tools here. And the way that we can copy it right up into the uh, machine profile here is by clicking on the arrow. So this is going to select everything once you, you know, do your bounding box. And then we're going to click on this arrow and that's just going to copy and paste it up into this window here. So again, this is your library and this is the machine.
So we'll click on the arrow. It's going to copy everything in there. Um, I could and I probably will make a video on how to set up tool libraries and assemblies and different things like that. But the way that I set up my tool library is if you click on any one of these components, you can actually click on the tool itself. And then you can uh, set you know, the diameter, the overall length, um, if there's any shoulders or tip geometry. Likewise, uh, if you want to set up a specific um, location for the tool, so this is tool 4, um, I have my SFM, um, my default speeds and feeds value every time that I pull this tool out, and then I can give a name for it as well. Likewise, if you click on that same tool, you can click on the holder, edit hold, holder, and you'll notice that I can import step geometry from the manufacturer, of whoever I'm purchasing this holder from. So I can actually pull this in and import it directly, and I can create tool assemblies that way. Very accurate, especially when you're working with like five axis or you're working with like um, high clearance uh, parts, because uh, every tool or tool holder is not going to be you know this you know square shape or the sil uh, cylindrical shape. Uh, when you're programming, there's actually going to be some tapers involved and different steps that will make it easier to machine um, deep passes and things like that. So uh, again, you don't have to go too much into that. Just wanted to explain uh, how to, you know, some of the things that I did when I was setting up my tool library to make it as accurate as possible. Uh, so as long as you have all this information copied up here in this uh, machine, we can go ahead and, and select the OK button. OK, so now I can go ahead and start applying toolpath. And the way that we're going to uh, program this piece out is we're going to do a face mill, we're going to do a dynamic mill, uh, and then we're going to do a final contour pass, then we'll do an edge break, and then, uh, or sorry, a drill, and then do our edge breaks. So we're going to do the face mill first. Uh, so here inside of toolpaths, we'll be in the toolpath folder, or 2D toolpath folder. We'll expand, expand the gallery, uh, and we'll look for face. And then uh, this should be familiar. It might default to solids. Um, if it does default to solids, go ahead and select the wireframe geometry because I do want to be able to choose the wireframe geometry that we just recently set up. Uh, make sure that it's chaining, and then we'll select on one of these edges. Do ensure that it does not go down um, in the Z. We actually want this to be here on like X and Y. So you can hit on the... Uh, red arrow here to continue it or if you want to you can actually like fast forward it uh, using this like red arrow with a line next to it you can actually just select you know the next line uh, that will be running with this loop so we'll uh, make sure that this loop is complete hit the green check mark and we've got our chain geometry here so we'll jump down here to tool and like I said before you know in previous videos we had to go and select a tool library and find a specific tool and filter it out by you know face mills and end mills and things like that now it's as easy as just you know scrolling to the top I know where my three inch face mill is I'm gonna select on my three inch face mill it actually updated and populated all my different uh, speeds and feeds and I can now just type in three inch face mill so a lot simpler uh, it just takes a little bit more time to set it up to get to this point um, likewise, you can see the uh, geometry for your tool holder, but we're not going to talk about that. Cut parameters, uh, make sure that we're going and doing one pass. Uh, I've gotten in the habit lately of just going to approach distance and ex exit distance for uh, face mills with 25%. Um, stock to leave on floor, uh, zero. And then depths of cut. Uh, if you go over here to the uh, Excel sheet, like I said, I, I have recommended depth passes. So in this instance for the 3 inch face mill, I have a uh, 062 depth of pass. So I'm going to change that to 0 0.0625. And then just make sure that we're keeping the tool down. Uh, because if we don't keep the tool down, it's going to make one pass, come back over to the starting point, and make another pass, and then you know go in that loop. We actually want it to take a pass, go down, take a pass, go down, take a pass, go down. Okay. Linking parameters, uh, very important on this page. Make sure that everything is reading absolute, 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 and absolute, uh, because we try to get in the habit of programming and absolute programming. And then likewise, uh, we can choose uh, and give dimensions for uh, you know the top of the stock and the depth. So for instance, top of stock, we can choose on this little icon here. And I can choose my top of my wireframe there. And depth, I'll choose on the top of the part itself. So that should read top of stock as 270 and depth should be zero. 
And just one good check is if you go here into planes, uh, ensure that you are on the correct operation that you're working in. So uh, now that we have multiple different you know, top planes uh, for OP1, OP2, and then the soft jaws, uh, just make sure that when you're working in OP1, it's reading OP1, OP1, OP1. If you don't see that, you can hit this little select WCS plane, and you can choose the correct plane, and then update and populate, populate this page accordingly. However, if you see OP1, 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 you do not have anything to worry about. And we'll just hit the green check mark. All right, so we see our toolpath there. Uh, looks good. Let me just verify and make sure that my uh, planes are reading correctly. So if you go up here to the verify, it's this little like half pipe looking thing next to the waves. It's going to open up my verify here in the background and I can go ahead and hit the play button. It looks like my toolpath is generating exactly how I want it to and I can go ahead and feel safe about programming my next pieces here. All right. So now we're going to go into dynamic milling. So dynamic milling is a little bit different than contour milling, and we've explored contour milling in previous videos. But uh, when we were working on like the 98431 part, we did a, you know, a roughing pass, and then we did the island pass. So we were able to remove stock material with the contour pass by offsetting it, uh, and then we came in with the final pass. However, that will be pretty difficult with this uh, geometry here because I have all these radii, steps, and slots and everything that I gotta look out for. So I'd have to like manually set up multiple different toolpath operations to get exactly the cleanup that I wanted before I finally made my final contour. Dynamic milling uh, does a really good job because it will actually recognize all the geometry that is surrounding the part itself and it'll remove it in an optimal way um, to reduce tool wear and increase uh, tool life. So it'll try to create a lot of different splines and arcs uh, in such a way that it will create uh, thick to thin chips pretty much all the time. And it won't overload your cutter uh, to the point where it's going to be in a situation where it'll, it'll break easily. So we're going to uh, select from the gallery here. If you uh, hit the drop down menu, we're going to find dynamic mill. And this is going to be a little bit different than previous toolpath because we typically just saw, you know, like wireframe or solids and we were able to choose between those. Um, those are all going to be now embedded in these different options, but we have to set up a handful of different options before we go ahead and, you know, get to that uh, page where we can set up our linking parameters and everything. So we do want to set up three things here. Um, first and foremost is, you know, the machining regions. And we can choose like automatic regions, but this is going to be difficult with the hole going through the part. So I'm actually not going to use automatic. We're going to set this up in a manual way. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up a machining region. So we're telling the toolpath here that uh, I want you to stay in or use this as reference for stock. So make sure that you're inside of wireframe. We have a chain set up just like what we did for the face mill. And we'll go ahead and finish up this loop. We want it to be on the X and Y uh, plane there and hit OK. So that's just telling the dynamic mill that, OK, this is the stock geometry that you have to work around. And now I'm telling you, uh, or telling the uh, dynamic mill, uh, do I want to stay within that stock geometry or can it come from the outside? So in this instance, uh, we don't have any like thin walls that are surrounding the part. Um, so I have the uh, optimal position to actually come from the outside and machine however I want to. So the second thing that we're going to do now is select from outside. So we're telling the uh, toolpath that it actually can approach uh, the material however which way that it wants to. And the last thing that we want to do whenever we're setting up uh, dynamic milling, this is the third step, is the avoidance regions. So this is telling the uh, toolpath okay, this might be your finished profile or it might be a specific piece of geometry that I do not want to cut away. So in our instance, we have the part here, uh, the 3D geometry, sitting in the center of our stock material. So I want that to be my avoidance region because I don't want the tool to actually come and cut across it because that's going to uh, scrap my part. So let's go ahead and choose avoidance regions. And inside avoidance regions, uh, I do want to uh, click on solids now and then ensure that instead of faces, I do have loops selected. And I'm gonna make sure that I'm selecting the top XY loop and not you know, this side profile here, but I'm gonna get this top XY loop. So that is the 
geometry that I want to avoid when this toolpath is generated. So we'll go ahead and click on the green check mark. I have three things that I selected. I have a machining region, which is our wireframe. Uh, we're choosing the from outside option, and then the avoidance region is going to be the part or the final profile in the center of the stock. So now we'll hit on the green check mark, and then we'll go over here to tools. If I have to have to you know come back in parameters and change something, I can always go into toolpath and you know if I have to toggle between stay inside or stay outside, just know that it's still available here. Um, but tool, we're going to choose a 312 end mill. So that's our 5 16th end mill. So we're just going to do 312 rough end mill. And then we'll come down here to cut parameters. Uh, stock to leave on walls. We'll actually leave, uh, yeah, let's leave like five thousandths. We can always increase it uh, if we want to. Um, but we're just leaving enough material to make a finish pass with the uh, quarter inch end mill here in the next step. So then we'll go to depth cuts. I'll make sure that I'm not going any more than if you look here on my page here, I have it set up for the 312 end mill. I don't want to go any further than um, 156. So in this instance, 156 and obviously you can change it to your application, but here we're doing the education and I don't want to really be breaking any tools I'm not running like mass production or anything Linking parameters um, Again ensure that this is all absolute 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 one thing to keep an eye out for now is where's my top of my stock? Because it's not where it's represented with that wireframe anymore because we cut that away with the face mill so my top of stock truly now is going to be the zero and my depth where I'm going to end up this cut is I'm going to go a little bit uh, south of my total length of my part. So depth, I'm going to click on that. I'm going to get my value. It's going to be 0.46. I'm actually going to go 100 thousandths deeper. So I'm going to go 0.56. And then I'm going to click on the green check mark. And look how easily it generated all of this toolpath. I just had to set up a handful of different uh, parameters to keep an eye out for before that toolpath was generated. But you can probably imagine and appreciate how hard or difficult or maybe even impossible this would be to write this all out by hand. And that just was able to generate it like that with a couple of clicks. So let's go ahead and do a uh, verify on this entire toolpath group and make sure that it's reading the way that I want it to. Okay, and one thing I like to do with my different toolpaths and my different operations is to go over here to verify and then change my color loop so I can see, uh, you know, a color for one tool and a color for another tool. So I'm going to hit the play button here. And you can see that it's actually milling out a pretty unique profile here. And I'll just pause it here for a second, but I could never truly create all these different arcs uh, and approaches with the contour toolpath. So this is a very unique and powerful uh, tool, and I'm actually going to rewind this and start it over again and slow it down. And I just want you to kind of appreciate this. So typically when we've done contouring, we've always just like gone and created a square around the part, or maybe whatever the shape might be, like the island shape. But now look at the geometry when this is cutting. So I'm going to hit the play button. And we'll notice that it's actually getting deeper as it's progressing in its cut, which is good because it starts off with a very easy cut and it's easing itself into the part. And as it continues to go around, it's creating again like that thick to thin, thick to thin, thick to thin uh, geometry for the chips to evacuate and escape. So we're coming around again. And even this, it creates like a, a pseudo spline or an arc. And again, this is just all geometry that was being generated automatically using that dynamic milling. And this is actually going in a little bit, and it's going to come out. It's just very, very powerful stuff. Uh, just make sure you are setting it up in the right way, or it's going to look a little goofy. However, uh, as long as you have your parameters and criteria set up, it should be really easy to get through. So I will fast forward this and see where I'm at. It looks like I'm doing pretty good. And now I'm just going to come in and I can make a final or finished contour uh, to clean up the part because it wasn't able to actually clean up uh, in this corner. I have a 125 radius here. 
Uh, if I'm using a 312 end mill, that's going to create a uh, 156 radius. So there's actually material here that won't be removed um, on this dynamic milling pass. But it got rid of the most of the material, and I would consider this a pretty optimal uh, roughing operation. So now, instead of having to create you know, multiple contour passes, I can go ahead and create one contour pass. So we'll create contour pass. Uh, we'll do the same thing that we did before. Select this like XY, make sure that it's going uh, right so we're climb milling. So I'll have to reverse the direction here. Hit the green check mark. Tool. We're going to choose the 250 end mill. If I can find it. All right. 250, and then we'll title this 250 finish end mill. Okay, cut parameters. Since there's not really much material left over on this, I can actually go like the full length of cut, which is very helpful. So if I go over here to depths, uh, I will not give a predetermined depth cut. Lead in, lead out, we'll make sure that that's active. And then in linking parameters, uh, once again, we just have to set, up, set this up so it's absolute, 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 and absolute. Top of stock will be the finished face and the depth We'll actually just go down here and we'll do the same thing. We'll uh, just go a little bit south. So in this instance, I might only go to like 0.5. So the rough was to like 0.56, the finish is like to 0.5. Uh, you can make them even, that's totally fine if you want to optimize your tool path, but we'll actually leave a little step here um, when we're machining this for the finish. Okay, so it looks like my uh, contour was generated. Let's go around and do a verify on it, and we'll play. Most of that's going to be the dynamic milling, and then there was my finish pass. So you see that there's just like a little step here, and you can see the step even more right there. So that was the endpoint of the dynamic milling. Oops. Sorry, I'm going to move this around here. So that was the endpoint of the dynamic milling, and then this was the finished profile of the contour. So you can see that that's where that 156 radius was tangent to either one of those edges, and that's where the 125 radius was tangent to either one of those edges. Okay, so now we're just going to plunge a hole uh, with the drill, and then we'll clean up uh, the uh, edges here, and we'll be done with the first operation. So go over here to drill, uh, in the 2D toolpath uh, gallery, we'll select this uh, hole. It'll tell us that it's a 213 diameter. Um, I just gotta go and look for a 213 drill. So I got that right there. So this will be 213. Uh, one thing I do wanna do on this uh, operation here, I'll just title it 213 drill, um, is I do wanna go through the entire length of the stock material. So I wanna go to uh, Linking parameters, make sure this is absolute, absolute. Top of stock, again, we'll just register the finished face. And then the depth, I want to actually select the bottom of my material here. And then, oops, absolute. It seems like it did not register the way I wanted it to. Yep. So even when I select that, it registered at zero. So I had to reselect it and make it 0.73. I'll actually go a little bit south. I'll go like 0.75. And then you can choose with your tip comp to break through. And this is very important because I've run into this a handful of times because I, I always forget to set up my uh, tip angle because we have a little bit um, more obtuse tip angles with the tools that we're using. So I'm used to using like 118 angles. But in this instance, you know, when I bought these tools, uh, I actually have different angles set up. And if you look at the 213 drill, I have a 140 uh, degree radius tip. So if I left that 118 there, it would compensate with a 118 angle, whereas with a, uh, a 140, it would be wider, so it would actually have to go down further to clean up and finish this pass. So make sure that you are you know, giving the correct tip angle and the breakthrough amount, I'm just gonna make it um, you know, 156, or sorry, 15 thousandths, not 156. And we'll hit the green check mark, and we'll see that that drill is ending right there. 
And then lastly, we'll come around and we'll do a uh, edge break with our chamfer mill, and then we'll do a chamfer drill on this uh, hole as well. So we'll go over here to the 2D gallery again. We'll locate model chamfer. Um, we're going to select the chain geometry. So on that toolpath type, we'll choose on select chains. Just like what we did with the finished contour, we'll select on that edge and make sure that the uh, arrow is going right. Uh, so we're climb milling and then the green check mark. The tool that we're gonna use is going to be the uh, chamfer cutter that we have set, set up here. So I'll just do chamfer, oops, chamfer edges. And then we'll go over here to cut parameters. Um, you wanna make sure that this is set up to uh, give the width and the, the depth of your chamfer here. So in our instance, I'm gonna give this a you know 156 set it again, uh, 15 thousandths, not 156. And then this will be 015 for the bottom offset as well. Uh, sometimes I'll leave this as zero. Uh, it just kind of depends on like how we're setting up the machine. I might actually come back here and change that to zero if it, if it looks too deep. Um, depth cuts, we won't worry about that. Linking parameters, nothing to really change there. And then we'll hit the green check mark. And then you can see the size of this tool. Um, basically by the, uh, you know, the lead in lead out radius here. And if I go and I look at my toolpath type here, uh, I can see the diameter. This is actually a half inch in diameter for the chamfer cutter, uh, which probably won't lend itself very good for a 213 hole. So we're actually going to use our spot drill to actually chamfer that hole in this instance. So, uh, in the 2D gallery, we have an option down here for hole making to select chamfer drill. And then we're going to select that hole there and hit the green check mark. And then we'll go over to tool. Got a little error there. You can just ignore that. Uh, we're going to go to tools and we're going to choose um, my spot drill, which is going to be my 10th tool here. And I'll just say uh, hole chamfer. And then go down here to cut parameters, same thing. Uh, we're just gonna give the width, and actually this one's actually a little bit wider. So the width of the depth of this chamfer, and this is gonna be 0.32. So it's just a little bit wider than the edge break on the outside. Linking parameters, just make sure that this is reading absolute, absolute, and then hit the green check mark. So now I'm gonna go ahead and simulate this entire uh, toolpath. Go over here to toolpath group and we'll do verify selected operations. So make sure that like when you are selecting this for verify, I'll minimize this window for a second, that when you are verifying all these little uh, file folders have a green check mark, check mark next to them. If they don't, they will not simulate. Okay. Select so looks good, looks good. And then I have my chamfer and everything there. So if I want to, I can like pull this back here and then I'll just go up to here and then I can slow it way down. And then you can see the, uh, the drill and the chamfer as well. So we'll play there. So we're coming around with our final pass. All right, this is the contour. This is going to be the drill. That's the chamfer edge. And then here's going to be the spot drill with the chamfer drill right there. So that should complete first operation. And make sure that you save this file out. Save as. I'll just title this because I'm gonna do a couple videos for it, but make sure you're saving it all the one file. I'm gonna name mine up one and then hit save. And again, if you wanted to post it out, make sure that you have the correct post for us, and then you'll select on toolpath group, uh, and then you'll be able to choose the G1, and then you should be able to post it to an NC file, and then I'll save it. Make sure that you are differentiating between op one, op two, and op uh, for the uh, soft jaws when you are exporting this. But you can see here, and again, you can gain greater, greater appreciation for it, but specifically with the dynamic milling, see this uh, 312 rough end mill? Look how much code is generated for that. That is just 
pretty incredible stuff right there. I could never imagine writing that out by hand. However, it's important for us to recognize and understand, you know, what these X, Y, and Z values are, as well as their G commands, because if something does uh, happen when you're proving out your program, you can identify it right away and see it before it actually happens when you're doing your single block. But yeah, that is a lot of code that is generated just for that one operation. Pretty incredible stuff there. So again, uh, make sure that your file is saved, and I'll catch you on the next video for Operation 2.